Philippi is very well hidden from the rest of the city. So well hidden that when bodies of farm workers started appearing in the irrigation dams, nobody realized the horror about to unfold. <laughs> Welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about Bible John and if you haven't seen that I will link it somewhere up here for you. But today we are going to talk about the Jesus killer who terrorized a small community in Philippi for nine months. And before we start I do just want to give a warning just to let you know that the story is graphic. But if you would like to hear who the Jesus killer is and how he got his infamous name then let's get into it. Intended for mature audiences only. On the 2nd of April 2005, a lady named Bonnie Swat was walking through like a forest or the bush area in Philippi when she noticed a man was kind of zipping up his pants and she thought maybe he was just going to the bathroom so she continued walking on her way to her house. Then as Bonnie starts to get closer to him, he kind of intercepts her path of where she was going and he stops her and says, you must come with me, follow me into the bush. And Bonnie's obviously like, no, thank you. I don't want to go in there. And she asks, why would you want me to come into the bush with you? And he plainly says, no, we're going to have sex and you must come with me in the bush. So Bonnie is now terrified and she starts screaming. She tries to get away. He grabs her arm and then he hits her over the head with a small rock, which he had picked up off the ground. So Bonnie is now dazed and she's kind of going in and out of consciousness. And he drags her and ties her hands behind her back and ties her to a tree. This mysterious man then sexually assaults Bonnie for a couple of hours and when he's done he just leaves her there still tied to this tree and Bonnie has still not really recovered from this hit on the head so she's still in and out of consciousness and she only gets discovered the next day when another man is busy walking through the bush and through the forest to wherever he was going. This man then untied Bonnie and took her to the nearest clinic so that she could get some help. A couple weeks later, a lady named Ellis B. Jarvis was busy walking through the same forest or bush area back home with her boyfriend and her two children when she noticed in the corner of her eye that there was a man just staring at her the whole time and he was staring at her and like watching her walk past with her boyfriend and her two children. But what really creeped Ellis B. out was that this man wasn't just watching them. Once they got to a certain point in their walk, this man got down on all fours and started crawling towards them so that he could kind of be unseen in the bush. And Ellisby kept saying in her head, you know, they live in a small town. They kind of know everybody around this little community and she's never seen this man before ever. But Ellisby's boyfriend also notices this guy and he's like, okay, come, let's just get out of here. They didn't know maybe if he was homeless and he was living there, if he was drinking, if he was on drugs. They didn't know anything, but they just knew that they didn't want to be in the same area that this creepy crawling man was in. So LSB and her boyfriend kind of part ways because they live separately. And LSB goes home with her children because she stays home with her mother at the time. So they're walking towards her mother's house. And when LSB gets home, she notices that her mother isn't there. And she thought, okay, maybe her mom's just at the pub or she's getting something to drink or she's just out having fun. We don't know. But sadly, LSB's mother was still not home that night. She was still not home the next morning. And days turned into weeks, unfortunately, that LSB's mom was still missing. Then on the 7th of May, 2005, LSB's two children were playing with other boys and girls in the area. And they were kind of playing by the houses and they were making a lot of noise. So they got told to leave because they were making a lot of noise. And they're like, oh, fine, let's just go play there on the hill and we can overlook the dam. But while these boys and girls are running up the hill, one of the boys stops and he looks down into the dam and he sees someone floating face down in the dam. And he shouts out to all the other girls and boys that there's a man in the dam. And they noticed as soon as the body was flipped over that this was their grandmother, Mina. And Mina was Alice B. Jarvis's mother. And now the people in this Philippi community were incredibly angry that this was another body that they had found because Mina was not the only person who had been attacked. When police had released what actually happened to Mina, she had been strangled and sexually assaulted and this enraged the community even more. 
because like I said, Mina was not the first body to be found and not the only lady to be attacked. This was the third body that was found in the Philippi area during the last couple months. And the community was just getting more and more angry that nothing was being done about it and police were trying to do stuff, but there were still bodies piling up and there were still no arrests. And like I said, police kept looking into this case, but by the end of winter, which is July, maybe August if we're lucky, there were around six bodies that were found in the Philippi area that had all been murdered in a gruesome and horrific way. But I think what makes this case more frustrating to the people who actually lived in the community was that the police didn't think that this was the same killer, even though the people of Philippi kept saying, this is the same guy, they're targeting people, you need to help us. But the police believed that it wasn't because the modus operandi of this killer was so different between each kill. And generally, when serial killers attack, they generally have a modus operandi or a specific way that they would kill. So let's say, for instance, they would find women with red hair, their kind of target that they would want to kill, and that would generally be what most of the women would look like. But in this case, it was not only women who were landing up near the dam in Philippi, it was men and it was women. And the only connection that they actually had, the police officers, was that all the bodies were landing around the same area. And what was also different was that this serial killer was also leaving victims alive. He was not killing every single person that he attacked. And this specific serial killer would only look for couples. So he would dispose of all the bodies in a dam or in a water source in Philippi, and he would look for couples only. So very strange that he would roughly try and find men and women who were walking together near the bush or near the forest, and he would attack those people specifically. He would either attack or kill the man with an ax, a knife, a punga, anything that he could find, and then he would sexually assault the woman. But like I said, he was more of an opportunist and he would not kill them in the same way. Now the woman who would survive these attacks would not only have to witness their lover, their friend or their brother, whoever they were walking with at the time, get murdered in front of them, but they would also have to relive and face this man's face every single day. But every single woman who had been sexually assaulted by this man noticed one thing in common and that was that he had Jesus written on his forehead. And the woman would describe that maybe it was like when you take ash out of a fire pit and you write with the ash on your arm, and that's what it kind of looked like. And I'm not sure if he wrote this on his head because maybe he believed that he was Jesus or as a similar power to Jesus, but I assume that maybe he wanted the woman to maybe feel like he was of ultimate power. And then things went really quiet. Remember I said that there were six bodies found around the end of our winter, so around July. And then in October of 2005, a couple named Mina and Lucas Manuel were busy sleeping in their home when they heard an incredibly loud bang. And Lucas got up instantly because he assumed someone was trying to break in, which he was correct. Someone was trying to get through their front door. While Mina was still in the house, she was hit a couple times and her husband Lucas was then dragged out of the house and beaten to death. Mina was then sexually assaulted in her bed. A neighbor of Mina and Lucas had heard all of this commotion and he had run out to try and help Lucas who was being attacked. And he sadly also had been attacked and beaten to death. This person who attacked both of them then dragged Lucas and his neighbor's body to the dam and left them in the area. But what was interesting about this specific attack was that Mina described three men who had come through the front door, but she also described the one man as having Jesus written across his forehead. But according to Mina, she said the man who had Jesus written on his head stayed in the house and the other two men were the ones who attacked her husband and her neighbor. And sadly, bodies and sexual assaults were starting to pile up. By the end of October, six women had been sexually assaulted and eight people had been murdered. A string of grisly murders has sparked fears of a serial killer on the outskirts of Cape Town. The hunting ground of a serial killer. These people think so, and they're terrified. In the past six months, mutilated bodies have been found in dams in the area. And the people of Philippi were getting more and more angry. They went to police stations all over Philippi. They were charging down the doors and saying to police, you need to fix this problem because it really is a problem and you guys aren't taking it seriously. 
And the police kept saying, we are trying to look into it, but there's no evidence. But then the people of Philippi would get upset with police even more because they said that police were not looking hard enough for evidence. And every time the people of Philippi would go around the crime scene after police had left, there was always evidence that they had either missed, overlooked, or just not bothered to pick up. But police kept insisting that this was a different person each time, so they were still not trying to link the same man to the same crimes. But I'm not sure if police were just not listening at all to the victims of this case who actually survived, because like I said, each woman who was sexually assaulted said that it was a man with Jesus on his head. And I'm not sure if maybe it was because this Jesus killer was not getting enough recognition, but he decided to draw up diagrams of where the police could find bodies. Drawings and diagrams would get to the police station and the police would then go out and see exactly what these drawings were showing and they would find bodies in the areas of these pictures. And what was even more terrifying is that while the police were looking for these bodies that the Jesus killer had drawn up for them, the Jesus killer was also going around the area in Philippi and writing on the walls or doors of the victims that he wanted to attack next and tell them that they're going to be the next victim who will be killed and sexually assaulted. Now, there are a lot of things that terrify me and one of those is a serial killer wandering around your neighborhood knowing your name and knowing where you live and telling you, I'm coming for you next. But in November 2005, a man who was walking through the bushes alone named Stanley Martins was intercepted by police and taken to the police station and arrested. And he was arrested on suspicion of murder. And police knew Stanley previously. He was constantly in and out of jail and in the runnings with the law all the time. Police were getting more and more flack about this case and they were not getting any closer to finding their suspects. So they needed a scapegoat. And Stanley Martins was their scapegoat. So Stanley Martins was taken to court and his defense lawyer pointed out every single flaw that these police officers had that was never going to put Stanley behind bars. And Stanley's defense lawyers just tore the police officers apart and their entire case. They were saying that Stanley was not even in Cape Town at the time of some of the murders and he couldn't have done them because he was out at specific times of the other murders. So everything was just not tying up for Stanley to be the murderer. The defense lawyers even took it a step further and they took a photo of Stanley around the area and to some of the victims. And all the victims said that that was not the man who sexually assaulted them. So the police didn't even bother doing that. And Stanley was eventually released, but this did not really help him because, the, like I said, this was a small community and some of the people who were not attacked or didn't really believe Stanley because they thought that he was a troublemaker anyway, it really ruined his reputation because people just kind of kept calling him the Jesus killer all the time. But then in December 2005, 14 people had been murdered and 22 people had now been sexually assaulted. But then police caught a lucky break when at a crime scene of a man who had been viciously attacked, they actually noticed a cell phone that was lying on the floor. And the police then opened the cell phone. They were going through the contacts on the call list and they noticed that a number had been dialed continuously. So the police dialed this number and it came up to a man who worked in Hrabo. And this was a man named Daryl. So police get in their cars and they head off to Hrabo to try and find this guy named Daryl. The police get there and they find him and they say, hey, is this your phone? Do you know whose phone this might be? And Daryl's like, oh yeah, that's my dad's phone. So police then track down a guy named Jimmy Maketa, who was a 41-year-old painter at the time. At the time, Jimmy was actually out on parole and police went up to him and they found him and they arrested him and he denied everything. So police kind of thought that this was their man and they kept him in the cold cell for a couple days and they just watched him. And while Jimmy was in the cell, he eventually confessed everything to his lawyer. He then also wrote everything down in a piece of paper and gave it to the investigating officer. But a little bit of backstory on Jimmy Maketa. He was born and raised in Krabo and lived there for most of his life. And he was married very happily for a couple of years until Jimmy started turning very violent against his wife. Him and his wife got married in the late 80s and they had three children together. And like I said, when they were first married, they were very happy and he would often shower her with gifts. But then everything kind of changed in an instant. When Jimmy would rage, he would absolutely attack his wife. He would beat her, he would sexually assault her, he would break some of her bones. But the thing that really pushed his ex-wife over the edge was the fact that he started sleeping around with other women and when she found this out she asked him for a divorce. She also kicked him out and that's how he became homeless and that's why he was living in the bush 
near Philippi. The police had DNA that they had taken from some of the victims and they ran it against Jimmy Maquetta's and it was a match. They also asked the victims of sexual assault to come into the police station, look at a photo or look at a live lineup of Jimmy and they all pointed out his picture or him live in the lineup. Jimmy was taken to trial and he did plead guilty to all of his charges, which were 46 in total. There were 18 charges of rape, 16 murder charges, six charges of house break-ins, two charges of robbery, two attempted murders, and two charges of assault. Jimmy McKetta was deemed to be an incredibly violent and incredibly dangerous criminal, and he was given a mandatory 25-year sentence, and he has been given life sentence, so he will stay in jail for the rest of his life. But because he was given 25 years mandatory, he cannot get parole, he cannot get appealed. Nothing can happen before the 25 years are up. And that is the case of the Jesus Killer and how Jimmy Maquetta terrorized the community of Philippi for nine months. I do just want to give another warning as well, if you're still listening to this end part of the video, that if you do look this case up on the internet, there are graphic images. So just be aware of that if you're going to do your own research. I obviously won't put those kind of pictures on this channel. Um, but you're free to look up whatever you want to. And I also just wanted to say a big thank you for all of the support. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Bye.